she must sacrifice herself for the family that had reared and brought her up to sacrifice herself for others was sonia's habit her position in the house was such that only by sacrifice could she show her worth and she was accustomed to this and loved doing it but in all her former acts of self-sacrifice she had been happily conscious that they raised her in her own esteem and in that of others and so made her more worthy of nicholas whom she loved but now they wanted her to sacrifice the very thing that constituted the whole reward for her self-sacrifice and the whole meaning of her life. And for the first time she felt bitterness against those who had been her benefactors only to torture her the more painfully. She felt jealous of Natasha, who had never experienced anything of this sort, and for the first time Sonia felt that out of her pure, quiet love for nicholas a passionate feeling was beginning to grow up which was stronger than principle virtue or religion under the influence of this feeling sonia whose life of dependence had taught her involuntarily to be secretive having answered the countess in vague general terms avoided talking with her and res the bustle and terror of the rostov's last days in moscow stifled the gloomy thoughts that oppressed sonia she was glad to find escape from them in practical activity but when she heard of prince andrew's presence in their house despite her sincere pity for him and for natasha she was seized by a joyful and superstitious feeling that god did not intend her to be she knew that natasha loved no one but prince andrew and had never ceased to love him she knew that being thrown together again under such terrible circumstances they would again fall in love with one another and that Nicholas would then not be able to marry Princess Mary as they would be within the prohibited. Despite all the terror of what had happened during those last days and during the first days of their journey, this feeling that Providence was intervening in her personal affairs cheered Sonia. At the Troitsa Monastery the Rostovs first broke their journey for a whole day. Three large rooms were assigned to them in the monastery hostelry, one of which was occupied by Prince Andrew. The wounded man was much better that day, and Natasha was sitting with him. In the next room sat the Count and Countess respectfully conversing with the prior, who was calling on them as old acquaintances and benefactors of the monastery. Sonia was there too, tormented by curiosity as to what Prince Andrew and Natasha were talking about. She heard the sound of their voices through the door. That door opened, and Natasha came out, looking excited not noticing the monk, who had risen to greet her and was drawing back the wide sleeve on his right arm. She went up to Sonia and took her hand. Natasha, what are you about? Come here, said the countess. Natasha went up to the monk for his blessing, and he advised her to pray for aid to God and his saint. As soon as the prior withdrew, Natasha took her friend by the hand and went with her into the unoccupied room. Sonia, will he live? She asked. Sonia, how happy I am, and how unhappy. Sonia, Dove, everything is as it used to be. If only he lives, he cannot. Because, 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 of, and Natasha burst into tears. Yes, I knew it. Thank God, murmured Sonia. He will live. Sonia was not less agitated than her friend by the latter's fear and grief and by her own personal feelings, which she shared with no one. Sobbing, she kissed and comforted Natasha. If only he lives, she thought. Having wept, talked, and wiped away their tears, the two friends went together to Prince Andrew's door. Natasha opened it cautiously and glanced into the room, Sonia standing beside her at the half-open door. Prince Andrew was lying raised high on three pillows. His pale face was calm, his eyes closed, and they could see his regular breathing. Oh, Natasha! Sonia suddenly almost screamed, catching her companion's arm and stepping back from the door. What? What is it? asked Natasha. It's that... That, said Sonia, with a white face and trembling lips. Natasha softly closed the door and went with Sonia to the window, not yet understanding what the latter was telling her. You remember, said Sonia with a solemn and frightened expression. You remember when I looked in the mirror for you. 
at Outrid No at Christmas. Do you remember what I saw? Yes, yes, cried Natasha, opening her eyes wide and vaguely recalling that Sonia... You remember, Sonia went on. I saw it then and told everybody, you and Duniasha. I saw him lying on a bed, said she, making a gesture with her hand and a lifted finger at each detail, and that he had his eyes closed and was covered just with a pink quilt. She had in fact seen nothing then, but had mentioned the first thing that came into her head, but what she had invented then seemed to her now as real as any other recollection. She not only remembered what she had then said, that he turned to look at her and smiled and was covered with something red, but was firmly convinced that she had then seen and said that he was covered with a pink quilt and that his... Yes, yes, it really was pink, cried Natasha, who now thought she too remembered the word pink being used, and saw in this the most extraordinary and mysterious part of... But what does it mean? she added meditatively. Oh, I don't know, it is all so strange, replied Sonia, clutching at her head. A few minutes later, Prince Andrew rang and Natasha went to him, but Sonia, feeling unusually excited and touched, remained at the window thinking about the strangeness of what had occurred. They had an opportunity that day to send letters to the army, and the countess was writing to her son. Sonia, said the countess, raising her eyes from her letter as her niece passed, Sonia, won't you write to Nicholas? She spoke in a soft, tremulous voice. Those eyes expressed entreaty, shame at having to ask, fear of a refusal, and readiness for relentless hatred in case of such refusal. Sonia went up to the countess and, kneeling down, kissed her hand. Yes, Mamma, I will write, said she. Sonia was softened, excited, and touched by all that had occurred that day, especially by the mysterious fulfillment she had just seen of her vision. Now that she knew that the renewal of Natish's relations with Prince Andrew would prevent Nicholas from marrying Princess Mary, she was joyfully conscious of a return of that self-sacrificing spirit in which she would. So with a joyful consciousness of performing a magnanimous deed, interrupted several times by the tears that dimmed her velvety black eyes, she wrote that touching letter the arrival of which had so amazed Chapter X the officer and soldiers who had arrested Pierre treated him with hostility but yet with respect in the guardhouse to which he was taken. In their attitude toward him could still be felt both uncertainty as to who he might be perhaps a very important person and hostility as a result of their recent personal conflict with him. But when the guard was relieved next morning, Pierre felt that for the new guard both officers and men he was not as interesting as he had been to his captors, and in fact the guard of the second, seventeen of the captured Russians, arrested and detained for some reason by order of the higher command. If they noticed anything remarkable about Pierre, it was only his unabashed, meditative concentration and thoughtfulness, and the way he spoke French, which struck them as surprising. In spite of this he was placed that day with the other arrested suspects, as the separate room he had occupied was required by an officer. All the Russians confined with Pierre were men of the lowest class, and, recognizing him as a gentleman, they all avoided him, more especially as he spoke French. Pierre felt sad at hearing them making fun of him. That evening he learned that all these prisoners, he, probably, among them, were to be tried for incendiarism, on the third day he was taken with the others to a house where a French general with a white mustache sat with two colonels and other Frenchmen with scarves on their arms. With the precision and definiteness customary in addressing prisoners, and which is supposed to preclude human frailty, Pierre, like the others, was questioned as to who he was, where he had been. These questions, like questions put at trials generally, left the essence of the matter aside, shut out the possibility of that essence's being revealed, and were designed only to form a channel. As soon as Pierre began to say anything that did not fit in with that aim, the channel was removed and the water could flow to waste. Pierre felt, moreover, what the accused always feel at their trial, perplexity as to why these questions were put to him. He had a feeling that it was only out of condescension, or a kind of civility, that this device of placing a channel was employed. 
He knew he was in these men's power, that only by force had they brought him there, that force alone gave them the right to demand answers to their questions, and that the sole object of that assembly, and so, as they had the power and wished to inculpate him, this expedient of an inquiry and trial seemed unnecessary. It was evident that any answer would lead to conviction. When asked what he was doing when he was arrested, Pierre replied in a rather tragic manner that he was restoring to its parents a child he had saved from the flames. Why had he fought the marauder? Pierre answered that he was protecting a woman, and that to protect a woman who was being insulted was the duty of every man. That they interrupted him, for the why was he in the yard of a burning house where witnesses had seen him? He replied that he had gone out to see what was happening in Moscow. Again they interrupted him. They had not asked where he was going, but why he was found near the fire. Who was he? They asked, repeating their first question, which he had declined to answer. Again he replied that he could not answer it. Put that down. That's bad. Very bad, sternly remarked the general with the white mustache and red flushed face. On the fourth day fires broke out on the Zubovska rampart. Pierre and thirteen others were moved to the coach house of a merchant's house near the Crimean Bridge. On his way through the streets, Pierre felt stifled by the smoke which seemed to hang over the whole city. Fires were visible on all sides. He did not then realize the significance of the burning of Moscow and looked at the fires with horror. He passed four days in the coach house near the Crimean Bridge and during that time learned from the talk of the French soldiers that all those confined there were awaiting a decision which might come any day from the what marshal this was pierre could not learn from the soldiers evidently for them the marshal represented a very high and rather mysterious power these first days before the eighth of september when the prisoners were had up for a second examination were the hardest of all for pierre chapters on the eighth of september an officer a very important one judging by the respect the guards showed him entered the coach house where the prisoners were this officer probably someone on the staff was holding a paper in his hand and called over all the russians there naming pierre as the man who does not give his name glance an hour later a squad of soldiers arrived and pierre with thirteen others was led to the virgin's field it was a fine day sunny after rain and the air was unusually pure the smoke did not hang low as on the day when Pierre had been taken from the guardhouse on the Zubovska rampart, but rose through the pure air in columns. No flames were seen, but columns of smoke rose on all sides, and all Moscow, as far as Pierre could see, was one vast charred ruin. On all sides there were waste spaces with only stoves and chimney stacks still standing, and here and there the blackened walls of some brick houses. Pierre gazed at the ruins and did not recognize districts he had known well. Here and there he could see churches that had not been burned. The Kremlin, which was not destroyed, gleamed white in the distance with its towers and the belfry of Ivan the Great. The domes of the new convent of the Virgin glittered brightly and its bells were ringing particularly clearly. These bells reminded Pierre that it was Sunday and the feast of the Nativity of the Virgin but there seemed to be no one to celebrate this holiday. Everywhere were blackened ruins, and the few Russians to be seen were tattered and frightened people who tried to hide when they saw the French. It was plain that the Russian nest was ruined and destroyed, but in place of the Russian order of life that had been destroyed, Pierre unconsciously felt that a quite different firm, French order, he felt this in the looks of the soldiers who, marching in regular ranks briskly and gaily, were escorting him and the other criminals. He felt it in the looks of an important French official. In he felt it in the merry sounds of regimental music he heard from the left side of the field, and felt and realized it especially from the list of prisoners the French officer had read out when he came that morning. Pierre had been taken by one set of soldiers and led first to one and then to another place with dozens of other men, and it seemed that they might have forgotten him or confused him with the others. But no, the answers he had given when questioned had come back to him in his designation as the man who does not give his name, and under that appellation, which to Pierre seemed terrible. 
Pierre felt himself to be an insignificant chip fallen among the wheels of a machine whose action he did not understand but which was working well. He and the other prisoners were taken to the right side of the Virgin's field, to a large white house with an immense garden not far from the convent. This was Prince Shcherbatov's house, where Pierre had often been in other days, and which, as he learned from the talk of the soldiers, was now occupied by the marshal, the Duke of Ekmol de Val they were taken to the entrance and led into the house one by one. Pierre was the sixth to enter. He was conducted through a glass gallery, an anteroom, and a hall, which were familiar to him, into a long low study at the door of which stood an adjutant. Devout, spectacles on nose, sat bent over a table at the further end of the room. Pierre went close up to him, but Devout, evidently consulting a paper that lay before him, did not look up. Without raising his eyes, he said in a low voice, Who are you? Pierre was silent because he was incapable of uttering a word. To him Devout was not merely a French general, but a man notorious for his cruelty. Looking at his cold face, as he sat like a stern schoolmaster who was prepared to wait a while for an answer, Pierre felt that every instant of delay might cost him his life. He did not venture to repeat what he had said at his first examination, yet to disclose his rank and position was dangerous and embarrassing. So he was silent. But before he had decided what to do, Devout raised his head, pushed his spectacles back on his forehead, screwed up his eyes, and looked intently at him. I know that man, he said in a cold, measured tone, evidently calculated to frighten Pierre. The chill that had been running down Pierre's back now seized his head as in a vise. You cannot know me, General. I have never seen you. He is a Russian spy, devout interrupted, addressing another general who was present, but whom Pierre had not noticed. Devout turned away. With an unexpected reverberation in his voice, Pierre rapidly began. No, Monsignor, he said, suddenly remembering that devout was a duke. No, Monsignor, you cannot have known me. I am a militia officer, and have not quitted Moscow. Your name? asked Devout. Bezukhov, what proof have I that you are not lying? Monsignor, exclaimed Pierre, not in an offended but in a pleading voice. Devout looked up and gazed intently at him. For some seconds they looked at one another, and that look saved Pierre apart from conditions of war and law, that look established human relations between the two men. At that moment an immense number of things passed dimly through both their minds, and they realized that they were both children of humanity and were brothers. At the first glance, when Devout had only raised his head from the papers where human affairs and lives were indicated by numbers, Pierre was merely a circumstance, and Devout could have shot him without he reflected for a moment. How can you show me that you are telling the truth? said Devout coldly. Pierre remembered Rambol, and named him and his regiment and the street where the house was. You are not what you say, returned Devout. In a trembling, faltering voice, Pierre began adducing proofs of the truth of his statements. But at that moment an adjutant entered and reported something to Devout. Devout brightened up at the news the adjutant brought, and began buttoning up his uniform. It seemed that he had quite forgotten Pierre. When the adjutant reminded him of the prisoner, he jerked his head in Pierre's direction with a frown and ordered him to be led away. But where they were to take him Pierre did not know. Back to the coach house or to the place of execution his companions had pointed out to him as they crossed the virgin's field. He turned his head and saw that the adjutant was putting another question to devout. Yes, of course replied devout, but what this yes meant, Pierre did not know. Pierre could not afterwards remember how he went, whether it was far, or in which direction. His faculties were quite numbed, he was stupefied, and noticing nothing around him went on moving his legs as the others did till they all stopped and he stopped too. The only thought in his mind at that time was, who was it that had really sentenced him to death? Not the men on the commission that had first examined him, not one of them wished to, or it was not devout who had looked at him in so human a way. 
In another moment, Devout would have realized that he was doing wrong, but just then the adjutant had come in and interrupted him. The adjutant, also, had evidently had no evil intent, though he might have refrained from coming in. Then, who was executing him, killing him, depriving him of life, him, Pierre, with all his memories, aspirations, hopes, and thoughts, who was doing this? It was a system, a concurrence of circumstances. A system of some sort was killing him, Pierre, depriving him of life, of everything, annihilating him. Chapter Xay from Prince Sherbatov's house, the prisoners were led straight down the virgin's field, to the left of the nunnery, as far as a kitchen garden in which a post had been set up. Beyond that post a fresh pit had been dug in the ground, and near the post and the pit a large crowd stood in a semicircle. The crowd consisted of a few Russians and many of Napoleon's soldiers who were not on duty Germans, Italians, and Frenchmen, in a variety of uniforms. To the right and left of the post stood rows of French troops in blue uniforms with red epaulets and high boots and shakos. The prisoners were placed in a certain order, according to the list, Pierre was sixth, and were led to the post. Several drums suddenly began to beat on both sides of them, and at that sound Pierre felt as if part of his soul had been torn away. He lost the power of thinking or understanding. He could only hear and see, and he had only one wish, that the frightful thing that had to happen should happen quickly. Pierre looked round at his fellow prisoners and scrutinized them. The two first were convicts with shaven heads. One was tall and thin, the other dark, shaggy, and sinewy, with a flat nose. The third was a domestic serf, about forty-five years old, with grizzled hair and a plump, well-nourished body. The fourth was a peasant, a very handsome man with a broad, light brown beard and black eyes. The fifth was a factory hand, a thin, sallow-faced lad of eighteen in a loose coat. Pierre heard the French consulting whether to shoot them separately or two at a time. In couples, replied the officer in command in a calm voice. There was a stir in the ranks of the soldiers, and it was evident that they were all hurrying, not as men hurry to do something they understand, but as people hurry to finish a necessary but unpleasant and incomprehensible a French official wearing a scarf came up to the right of the row of prisoners and read out the sentence in Russian and in French. Then two pairs of Frenchmen approached the criminals and at the officer's command took the two convicts who stood first in the row. The convicts stopped when they reached the post and, while sacks were being brought, looked dumbly around as a wounded beast looks at an approaching huntsman. One crossed himself continually, the other scratched his back and made a movement of the lips resembling a smile. With hurried hands the soldiers blindfolded them, drawing the sacks over their heads, and bound them to the post. Twelve sharpshooters with muskets stepped out of the ranks with a firm regular tread and halted eight paces from the post. Pierre turned away to avoid seeing what was going to happen. Suddenly a crackling, rolling noise was heard which seemed to him louder than the most terrific thunder, and he looked round. There was some smoke, and the Frenchmen were doing something near the pit, with pale faces and trembling hands. Two more prisoners were led up. In the same way and with similar looks, these two glanced vainly at the onlookers with only a silent appeal for protection in their eyes, evidently unable to understand or believe what was going to happen. They could not believe it because they alone knew what their life meant to them, and so they neither understood nor believed that it could be taken from them. Again Pierre did not wish to look and again turned away. But again the sound as of a frightful explosion struck his ear, and at the same moment he saw smoke, blood, and the pale. Pierre, breathing heavily, looked around as if asking what it meant. The same question was expressed in all the looks that met his. On the faces of all the Russians and of the French soldiers and officers, without exception, he read the same dismay, horror, and conflict that were in his own heart. But who, after all, is doing this? They are all suffering as I am. Who then is it, who flashed for an instant through his mind? Sharpshooters of the 86th forward shouted someone. The fifth prisoner, the one next to Pierre, 
was led away alone. Peter did not understand that he was saved, that he and the rest had been brought there only to witness the execution. With ever-growing horror and no sense of joy or relief, he gazed at what was taking place. The fifth man was the factory lad in the loose cloak. The moment they laid hands on him, he sprang aside in terror and clutched at Peer. Peer shuddered and shook himself free. The lad was unable to walk. They dragged him along, holding him up under the arms, and he screamed. When they got him to the post, he grew quiet, as if he suddenly understood something. Whether he understood that screaming was useless, or whether he thought it incredible that men should kill him, at any rate he took his stand at the post, waiting to be blindfolded like the others, and like a wound. Pierre was no longer able to turn away and close his eyes. His curiosity and agitation, like that of the whole crowd, reached the highest pitch at this fifth murder. Like the others, this fifth man seemed calm. He wrapped his loose cloak closer and rubbed one bare foot with the other. When they began to blindfold him, he himself adjusted the knot which hurt the back of his head. Then, when they propped him against the blood-stained post, he leaned back and, not being comfortable in that, Pierre did not take his eyes from him and did not miss his slightest movement. Probably a word of command was given and was followed by the reports of eight muskets, but try as he would, Pierre could not afterwards remember having heard the slightest sound of the shots. He only saw how the workman suddenly sank down on the cords that held him, how blood showed itself in two places, how the ropes slackened under the weight of the hanging body, and how the workman sat down. Pierre ran up to the post. No one hindered him. Pale, frightened people were doing something around the workman. The lower jaw of an old Frenchman with a thick mustache trembled as he untied the ropes. The body collapsed. The soldiers dragged it awkwardly from the post and began pushing it into the pit. They all plainly and certainly knew that they were criminals who must hide the traces of their guilt as quickly as possible. Pierre glanced into the pit and saw that the factory lad was lying with his knees close up to his head and one shoulder higher than the other. That shoulder rose and fell rhythmically and convulsively, but spadefuls of earth were already being thrown over the whole body. One of the soldiers, evidently suffering, shouted gruffly and angrily at Pierre to go back. But Pierre did not understand him and remained near the post, and no one drove him away. When the pit had been filled up, a command was given. Pierre was taken back to his place, and the rows of troops on both sides of the post made a half turn and went past it at a measured pace. The twenty-four sharpshooters with discharged muskets, standing in the center of the circle, ran back to their places as the companies passed by. Pierre gazed now with dazed eyes at these sharpshooters who ran in couples out of the circle. All but one rejoined their companies. This one, a young soldier, his face deadly pale, his shako pushed back, and his musket resting on the ground, still stood near the pit at the spot. He swayed like a drunken man, taking some steps forward and back to save himself from falling. An old, non-commissioned officer ran out of the ranks and taking him by the elbow dragged him to his company. The crowd of Russians and Frenchmen began to disperse. They all went away silently and with drooping heads. That will teach them to start fires, said one of the Frenchmen. Pierre glanced round at the speaker and saw that it was a soldier who was trying to find some relief after what had been done, but was not able to do so. Without finishing what he had begun to say, he made a hopeless movement with his arm and went away. Chapter Xi After the execution, Pierre was separated from the rest of the prisoners and placed alone in a small, ruined, and befouled church. Toward evening, a non-commissioned officer entered with two soldiers and told him that he had been pardoned and would now go to the barracks for the prisoners of war. Without understanding what was said to him, Pierre got up and went with the soldiers. They took him to the upper end of the field, where there were some sheds built of charred planks, beams, and battens, and led him into one of them. In the darkness, some twenty different men surrounded Pierre. He looked at them without understanding who they were, why they were there, or what they wanted of him. He heard what they said, but did not understand the meaning of the words, and made no kind of deduction from or application of them. 
He replied to questions they put to him, but did not consider who was listening to his replies, nor how they would understand them. He looked at their faces and figures, but they all seemed to him equally meaningless. From the moment Pierre had witnessed those terrible murders committed by men who did not wish to commit them, it was as if the mainspring of his life, on which everything depended and which made everything appear a lie, 